So let's start. That I finish on time today. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, it seems uh, most of the people here in Kongsberg know about move semantics. That's good, because this room is only half packed. So let's see whether we know everything. Um, I'm talking today about a problem we have since we introduced move semantics and a couple of uh, side effects of that, uh, which are, well, surprisingly often not known. And um, so let's look into the details of the nightmare of move semantics for even trivial classes. Um, the promise is that in C++, you don't have to deal with things you don't want to deal with. And one easy thing I want to, don't want to deal is with some details of some strange internal handling of move semantics, etc. at all. So let's program a very trivial class. This is a class customer, and the class customer has a f three members, first name, a last name, and an ID. Anything, anything problematic here with this class? I don't think so. So what is the way we implement the constructor usually, what we learned since C++ 198? This way. So let's initialize the first name, the last name, and the um, ID. Uh, last name and ID uh, have default values. So we take, as we learned, all the arguments by constant reference and instead of int, because passing int by value is the fastest thing we have. And then we take these arguments to initialize the members first and last. So let's create a customer. Let's create a customer and initialize it with the first name and the last name. So this is an exercise for you. How many expensive string calls, potentially expensive string calls, are here involved? What I mean is, Assume that we don't have this short string optimization, which makes everything copy a, a cheap operation. Um, how many times do we have to copy a string, which means call the copy constructor or copy assignment operator, which means that if, the, if we don't have the short string optimization or if the string is reasonably long, so the names have more than 15 characters in practice, that this yeah, that this happens. That how, ma how often do we have this expensive string cards? Everybody has an opinion? Who thinks two? None. Oh, great. Three. Four. Five. Six. OK. Eight. Zero. <laughs> Anything worse than eight? OK, I forgot seven. <laughs> Let's see. This is what we have when the program is compiled. We have in the text, in the, in the generated data segment of the program, we have stored somewhere these two string littles, Joe and Fix, whatever is the last name called Fix, but that's a different issue. Um, so what do we have, what, has, what happens here? Well, the first thing is, we have two arguments, f and l, in the constructor. The type of the arguments does not fit the type of the, uh, the, type of the parameters in the constructor does not fit the, the type of the arguments we pass to the constructor. So there will be an implicit type conversion, which means that we create a string. OK, so let's create it that the first time we alloc memory um, at least for the non-trivial cases. But that's not enough, because then we have the operations that we perform in the constructor, and that means we have um, the statements to initialize first and last by f and l. And that means that in addition, we create a copy of these temporary objects uh, for both the first and the last name, and that's our new object. And then the temporary parameters, f and l, get deleted. So the correct answer is we have four mallocs. 
Two times we create a string, two times we copy a string. This is probably not perfect. So, and as we are usually interested in good performance, how can we deal with that? Well, it's easy. Let's overload this for the case that we pass string literals. So, let's take another constructor taking two string literals, and that means we only have two mallocs because these string literals are passed um, by value, which means uh, they are passed um, as a raw pointer, which is cheap, and then the raw pointer is used to initialize the string members. Good. Well, what happens if we have um, a combination of an STD string and a string literal? Mm, okay, too bad. That will not use the second constructor, it will use the first constructor. So, oh, that was the wrong button. So we will um, have three mallocs here, because we have the initial problem in the second argument here. So what that means is clear, we need all four combinations. <laughs> it gets worse. Okay, so we can move a string, and we try to move a string we don't need anymore, and we pass a string little. Now what, what is used here? Well, the problem is we have only a constructor. With the first argument is a string where we no, no longer need the value, but this string where we no longer need the value is used as an f, so we move here. We don't move here because the argument is a const object, and for const objects, move semantic is disabled. So we have here two mallocs, although this should be only one malloc. So we need even more overloads, a couple of overloads for both ordinary string references, so L-value references, and R-value references, where we then move the value to make this cheap, which, by the way, also works for um, for string little, so we have the, the cast, the, the, the implementation here, the second implementation, the constructor introduced here, would steal the memory from the past strings when we have move semantics, so that we only have, the, have here two mallocs. Good. And of course, here we need also all combinations. You like that, huh? I only want to initialize my customer by a couple of strings. So everything looks nice now. Hmm? Oh, wait a minute. I initialize my customer with a raw string here. What's the problem here? It's ambiguous because I have default arguments in all four constructors now. So um, it's not clear what to choose from, from the compiler for this case, because both the, um, the, um, the, the, the second and the, the last option works, so we have to remove um, initializations, the default values from some of these constructors, being very carefully which one to choose. Good. Is this everything good? No. <laughs> Let's use the assignment operator to initialize the name. And what's the problem here? This, none of this constructors works because we have here an, an explicit initialization. So we use here the initialization, uh, the, the copy initialization, and by rule, it's not allowed to have there two implicit conversions because this requires that on the right side, the thing, which is a string literal, first converts to a string and then converts to a customer. So this will also not compile. This is a general rule that has been there before move semantics. If you have a class struct, or a, a class S or a struct S, and you have a constructor taking an STD string, you can't initialize the string with the equal sign. Anything else will work. So are we done now? Well, if we make it good, 
we end up with something like this, with good performance and everything should compile. Is this something we like? <laughs> no. Well, I, I hate that. So can we do better? Well, it's OK. The, as, as I said, the performance is nice. But that's, these are a lot of overloads we have. And if you look in the standard, in classes that take strings as arguments, we have all these overloads where we have classes that take strings as arguments. Because um, we can do better, but we came from initially passing the arguments by const reference, and that's a problem now. So let's look at an alternative, an interesting alternative, which we think is crazy. Pass by value. Ooh. Pass by value is expensive. So what happens here? If we pass by value, well, still we have the problem with uh, two conversions when we direct initialize with a string little. But in principle, it works, but it works bad. We have four mallocs and four mallocs and three mallocs here. So what can we do? And look at this, we can move the pass by value arguments. And suddenly, things become great. We have two mallocs here, two mallocs here, one malloc here, and it can't get better. And um, we have some move operations in addition. So because what we do here, and that's an interesting lesson learned here, that we say, instead of taking an argument by const reference, it's better to take it by value and then move it to its destination if the destination if the, is the sink of this value. And that's a rule you should know. That's a style guide we should have introduced with C++ 17, uh, excuse me, C++ 11. Uh, unfortunately, nobody writes style guides anymore. Well, some write on, on websites, but nobody writes books and discusses them in detail. So this is not very well known, because move is cheap. This is good. This is the best you can do. So do we have alternatives? Yes. We have perfect forwarding. Because to save something, we can also use another approach saying, well, let's not make the mistake that the argument is a string here. Let's take the argument as it is and then perfectly forward it to initialize the member. That might be an alternative. So let's discuss a little bit this alternative. It would look like this. So you would say, whatever I get for initialization, I get it as it is. If it's constant, I get it as a constant. If it's non-constant, I take it as non-constant. If it has move semantics, so if it's a temporary object on, on an L value, uh, marked with move, then um, this should be forwarded to initialize the member, and it should be perfectly forwarded. And we have a way to do that. The way to do that is to take the arguments or the parameters by um, R value reference, so with two ampersands, and then use perfect forwarding, which you do with std forward, which to some extent, covers all the cases here listed. Looks good? Well, might be a little bit more complicated than, than just one constructor taking by value and then convert, but we save a couple of moves because, for example, if we pass a string literal here, this string literal is forwarded as a string literal, so that means as a const reference or as a string array, a character array, and then it is used, this, the character array is used to initialize a string. So we save a move of a string here with this alternative. So what happens if we have this? We don't create a temporary object that is a string 
F and L are just other names for the string literals we have in the program, and we use them directly to initialize our object. So that's even better than taking by value and move. So we have two mallocs here, two mallocs here, one malloc here. This is more or less perfect. Well, beware. Are we done? So this talk today is only 16 minutes, unless we try something out. Let's initialize the customer F with Nico, so with only one argument. Does it compile? Of course, it doesn't compile, otherwise I would hadn't, wouldn't have this slide. <laughs> so what's the problem? Yeah. The compiler says you th there's a conversion requested from const character 5 to a non scala type cast. What? What this means is, it takes the argument and tries to convert the argument to an object of type cast, which should not be happening. It should be a conversion to a string, because we initialize a member of type string. So a couple of things are wrong. First of all, here, we need, when we have default values for template functions, we need default values for both the arguments and the affected template arguments. So that's the first problem we have to solve. That's a general rule with templates. So if you have default values, deduction will no longer work for them. Deduction of templates does not apply to default values, default values for arguments. So you have also to place there a matching default type. So we try, let's try to compile it. It works on GCC, it works on Clang, but unfortunately it doesn't work on Visual C++. It's a little bit uh, questionable who is right here. Uh, I had some discussion with some guys after I gave this talk the last time. I think GCC and Clang are correct, this should work. And I should also say, um, I didn't check yet whether this is uh, fixed with, with little C++ 17, but beware. I said yesterday already, never trust somebody teaching you C++. We don't know exactly what is right here. So there's a problem here. Um, so, but probably GCC and Clang are correct here, and it should work. The other option is, which definitely works for all three, look at this, you take as a default argument to take std string. That will work. So, great, we have solved this problem. Let's go to the next problem. Let's initialize the customer G with the customer F we've just created. Here's the customer F initialized by Nico. It works now. Customer G is initialized by the customer F which, of course, should call the copy constructor. <laughs> Again, we get an error. There is no matching constructor for the initialization of an STD string here. Hmm. What's the problem here? We, if you have a good error message, or maybe a better error message, the compiler tells you it tries to create a customer where the first argument is a customer and the second is a string. <laughs> because what we have here, well, I, I should extend this example. If I try to initialize my customer with a const customer, it works. So this class, taking an arbitrary elements to initialize my first and last name, 
somehow disables the constructor when we pass a non-const object, but with the const object, the construction works, the copy construction. So what is the problem? Our constructor we introduce here is a better match than the copy constructor. <coughs> so in the case you see here, which doesn't work, our initializing constructor is used instead of the ordinary predefined copy constructor. Which means that this, our constructor takes the two, this first argument, the seconds have defaults, and this first argument it tries to use to initialize the first name. So it tries to initialize the first name of a new customer with an existing customer. Yeah, we have some flaws in the standard, and one thing is that it's easily to override with uh, user-defined customers the built-in copy constructors so that they have higher priority. Because the point is, it's a better match. It's, it's a better match to use our constructor because we don't need any type conversion, because our type does not need a const. And the copy constructor needs a const customer and that's a type conversion, our constructor is a better match because it doesn't need the conversion of the argument to const, so this is preferred. And therefore, the copy constructor is used in the second case because in the second case, uh, the, co the inbuilt copy constructor is a better match because it's a non-template and we have a template and there's no type conversion involved. We love C++, don't we? So what's the way to, to deal with that? Well, we have invented something, well, some tricks, some, some deep corner template tricks. The way you do that is to say, I enable this constructor only if I don't pass a customer as first argument. Otherwise, it is disabled. That's the way you program that. There are a couple of ways to program this. Um, we have this technique in a, very, in a lot of places in the standard. Um, when, you, when you find in the standard the text shall not be used in overload resolution, shall not participate in overload resolution if or unless, then we use this trick internally. So we say we, we, we disable the visibility of a function like a constructor if uh, for certain scenarios because otherwise this function should, will be used and that would be an error. We want to have something else be called. And we have that in a couple of places in the standard. So shall not participate in overload resolution is a key phrase you can look at. Okay, so what does it do? Let's look what we have here. This is a trick saying, I have an enable if, I enable this constructor if we have the same, if the first argument is the same as a customer. Okay, we call this technique to sfine out this constructor. Sfine is um, one of the two worst words we have invented for C++. It's partially our fault when we wrote the C++ templates book um, this means substitution failure is not an error. And what the trick of enable if is, it creates invalid code. And if template instantiation creates invalid code, the code is ignored. That's the trick behind enable if. Good. So let's do it here. There are different ways to do that. Um, with C17, we can do it a little bit shorter. Look at this. With C14, we had to use type name here, uh, and then enable FT, and is same. Well, let's first use the C11 version. In the C11 version, we only had std enable if, and then you. Uh, enable if and we have is same, both are type functions. Is same checks whether two types are the same. Enable if gives you then uh, if this condition is met, says this is valid code. 
In both cases, we get something as a result. We get a, a structure or a pseudo-structure. And it's same, we get a value, true or false, which we can access with colon colon value. And with enable if, we get a type with colon colon type, which is ignored here, the type. The type doesn't matter, but enable if gives you a type, so you have to, to do that. Uh, otherwise, you have no correct syntax here in the template, because in the template argument, you need something like a type if you use something like a type name. So we fix this because you need it, because this enable if yields a type. And if you have a structure yielding a type, you, you have to use type name in front of the std enable if. So in the next version in C++14, we fix that so we can get rid of type name here and can instead use std enable if type, underscore t, enable if type. And then we fixed in C++17, we fix the other case accordingly that we can say instead of is same something, colon, colon, value, we can just write is same v. And that will give you the expression. But this is the way it would be written now in C++17. So, everything solved? No, still doesn't compile. Why? Why? Because it's not the same type. S1, in this case, is not a customer. It's a customer reference. So this is the same type. Uh, according to some obscure rules in the standard, what this means to initialize uh, a, a perfect forwarding universal reference with an L value. There, this, is a, this is a rule, forget it. Well, the good thing is it works now. Does it really work? Well, first of all, I want to show you something about C++20. In C++20, things like this, with, which are workaround to say, this constructor should not be used if, which is some kind of a precondition or requirement we want to program, this will change in C++20 that you can simply write here requires that S1 is not the same type as a customer reference. This is a side effect of concepts. Unfortunately, we didn't get it in C++17, but okay. So, everything solved now? Well, <laughs> let's derive a class from customer. So let's derive a class VIP for very special customers. And let's true the same. So let's uh, initialize a VIP with a string little, that works. Let's initialize a VIP with a copy constructor, that works. Um, I skipped the rule. And um, where is it? Yeah, here. Let's initialize a customer with a VIP. Which should work. I mean, we have a derived class, and by definition, inheritance means every VIP is a customer, so it can be used as a customer. It could be copied to a customer where we skip all the additional attributes of the object. This will be an error. Why? We call this constructor, and we, well, we try to call the copy constructor, but unfortunately, this constructor is taken because it is only ruled out, disabled, if the passed argument is a customer reference. And what we pass is a VIP reference. So, we should make it better. We should say, let's make it is convertible to a customer. And we get a different error. <laughs> and that was the moment I scratched my head and said, what the hell is going on here? I 
I did everything correct. I check here, don't use this constructor if the past argument is not convertible to a customer, which by the way means we can skip the reference because even a reference is convertible to a non-reference, so that should work. Who has an idea what the problem is here? This is the error message I got. Well, I have <laughs> highlighted it and used some new lines here. Yeah? So you mean it's a problem with cons correctness? <laughs> Maybe? You, you mean or not? <laughs> yeah? OK. So you're proposing, yeah, there's a problem with cons and non-cons, etc. I tried all these things out. I thought about them all. And you know what? No, that's not the problem. Do you know what the problem is? We have undefined behavior. Why? We have a logical problem in our code for a couple of slides now. The logical problem is when we decide whether we can initialize the customer, we check whether we can convert the argument to a customer. What do we need to decide whether we can convert the argument to a customer? The constructor, which we are currently checking whether we enable or disable it. You get it? So if we are lucky, lucky, this does not compile. And if we are not lucky, this compiles, but no guarantee that what happens here. So the moment we introduced this is convertible trick, we made a logical error because we were specifying the visibility of the constructor according to the rules of which constructors are there, which we just defined. OK? Things like that happen. And if it's any proof, then I would say, keep it simple. <laughs> so it turned out, if I Con if I change the initialization, so here I check, is it not convertible to a customer? Then I disable it. If I turn this around, is this co positively convertible to a string? Then I enable it. So then it has defined behavior, and suddenly the bug is away. Perfect. We're done. Great. And with C20, we would use requires here. And that's a solution that works. Do we like it? Do you like it? So let's summarize a little bit what we have seen. You can run into all these problems you saw with perfect forwarding, which would mean that we have the perfect amount of allocations which means we have the perfect amount of copies and moves. If you like that, and if you like to program like that, do it. But don't give me your code. I will reject to maintain it. Because this is almost impossible for the ordinary application programmer to maintain. Although we do that a lot in the standard. We do. So. Let's talk about the alternatives we have. Here are a few cases we have. So we have a string, and we take our customer, and we have different ways to initialization. The first two cases should have two mallocs, and the last one had, should have one malloc. So if we use the classical way we learn things, take a const reference, then copy, we have 10 mallocs, or 10 potential mallocs, depending on the size of the string. If we do it that way, that we say we have a couple of strings taken by value and then move them in, 
we have five malocs, but some moves which we can make better if we overload for a couple of different versions so that we have for each and every special case a specific implementation. And you have seen the three fourth alternative, use perfect forwarding and disable this in cases where you should disable this function. You can choose. And you know what? I prefer the thing in the middle. Because a move is cheap. A move is cheap now. It's like passing an end. Well, two ends. Well, three ends. Because what you pass off a string is um, its uh, size, its capacity, and the pointer to the memory. If you care for three ends assignment, then you better use um, assembler. Well, no, there are corner cases, I know. But usually this is not worth it. Um, you might argue it's even not worth it to optimize this in any case. I stay with, uh, with what I stay. Don't get me wrong, performance is not everything. Maintainability is the most important thing. But if you care for some performance and you have to choose between two options and one of them is uh, more or less the same way of typing, but safer or more performing. I prefer the latter. So therefore, I prefer the one in the middle, which should be taught or teached every, in, every, in each and every C++ class. However, the problem is we claim that the ordinary programmer, ideally, should not use program any move. Move is bad. Well, this is, this is an example where it Definitely should use move because this is the best and easiest way to do. There were, by the way, proposals to say this should be hidden behind something. So there should be a way to say take the argument and forward it as it is with move or not and do this technique internally without seeing it literally in the code. Just say take this argument to initialize the member. What we originally had in C++, but now according to the evolution, we have to do something special like using move here to make it uh, happen. The, all these proposals were rejected. Um, okay, don't forget, if you want to initialize with an equal sign and a single argument, you need still the overload for const character star in all three cases, um, but that's a thing independent from C++. Uh, from, from modern C++, so from move semantics. Um, when I gave this talk before, one question was, do I solve this by using string view? Because in C++ 17, we have now string view, which some people claim is a better string. It's a sometimes better string, but definitely more dangerous string. And you should know what you do. But in this case, you can use it. You could say, well, let's take a string view in the constructor. Everything converts easily to a string view. It's a very cheap conversion. An SCD string converts cheaply without allocation to a string view. A string literal uh, converts to a string view without allocation, etc. So isn't this the better approach? Well, the answer is no, it's not. You save malloc's in a couple of cases, but in one case, you, have, you introduce a problem. If you get something movable, so if you call a constructor with a temporary SCD string, guess for example here in the second part of the example on the right, we have a function returning a temporary string, and we use this to initialize our customer. Then the problem is, this string will be converted to a string view, and the string view will, will then be converted to a string which allocates memory, instead of stealing our memory from the original string passed here as an argument. So string view is not a solution here. String view is never a solution if you have at the end of your call chain the need for a string. Don't use string view in call sequences where at the end you need a string. Okay? Good. So, does this, what we heard, only apply to constructors? 
No. What you have seen here is a consequence that if I want to program a class, a trivial constructor for a trivial class having two strings, and the same applies if the members are vectors or something else, whatever, whenever you have some member that allocates something or does something more complicated, where move is worth the effort. Then the constructor takes the argument and initializes the member. And the best approach is, as soon as possible, create the final type and then only move, 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 move. That's a general lesson. And the point is that first and last are things. So we get a value in which we take, to, which we steal to initialize something. We are sync of the value which is passed. And, in th and that you have in other cases too. Well, here's the possible cons character star constructor. But if we have a set and a getter, the same rules apply. So if you have a set and a getter in your class, what you should do now is take the value by value, the argument by value, the parameter by value, and move it into your member. Because otherwise you have the same problem that you have unnecessary additional allocs. Again, unfortunately, this is not taught anywhere, as far as I know, in style guides. It should. So the general rule I introduced here in 45 minutes if, is if you have parameters for things, so you give an object the value, you, you, you present it, you hand it over the value for some way, for some usage. Don't pass by reference. Pass it by value and move it to the final location. That's it. This example shows C++ is tricky. Pass by value is becoming better and better with move semantics. And this is the advertisement, three seconds. Thank you very much. <laughs>